Right, while we're setting up, I'm about to hand, hand a hand. I'm going to hand. I'm going to hand this uh, microphone over to uh, the harmonica player, as it were. How about that? But um, I just want you to know we, are, we have a lot going on for the kids after this. Uh, this, is, this. All these chairs are going to get stacked up, go against the wall. This is going to be a broom ball court. We've got a Nerf gun fight over there. We've got bounce houses set up. We're going to do all sorts of stuff. Nacho bar in the foyer. If you have little ones, hey, stay, stay with them. You come hang out, chill out with them. Uh, we invite you to, to stay and play. We're not like, hey, leave us your kids and go away for two hours. That's creepy. Of course you can stay. Uh, if you have a little one, yeah, yeah, come and, and let them play. We just don't want anybody to get trampled. Uh, also, we're going to, kids aren't going to get trampled. We'll, we'll divide them up by age so that we're not playing broom ball sixth grade and kindergartner. All right. Uh, so uh, it will be appropriate for all ages, uh, except for the older ones. I may trample them. Uh, but just wanted you to know that, Charlie. Come on. We're going to do a uh, baby, uh, baby dedication today. And my wife always tells me, she says, you know, <laughs> the scariest thing is giving Charlie a captive audience and a microphone. <laughs> So, uh, but I'm not going to do a medley of my greatest uh, harmonica hits. Uh, we're here today for the parents and these babies. And uh, so here's the way this works. This is very much like a wedding ceremony where um, the parents bring up their child and we go through a series of statements about what the parent's responsibility is with these children. And then there is a responsibility of you, the church. We're one family here. And this is all part of it. So I will be asking for commitment from the church as well at the end of this. So um, it's, uh, this is a wonderful thing and a wonderful time. And I have a couple of parents here. And if you have a child and you didn't sign up with me earlier, that's okay. We, uh, we can just come on up uh, or raise your hand and let me know you want to. But um, we have two, uh, two uh, families today. I have Marty and Ashley McKee with Gus. If you would come on up and be a part of this. <clears throat> Don't want to drop anything here. <laughs> and um, Brittany and Dominic Segura with Slade. Is there anybody else that, uh, that's participating today that I didn't know about? All right. This <laughs> okay. So I'm going to put the parents on the spot first, and, um, and this is, I'm going to read off a series of statements to the parents, and then uh, we'll, we'll ask for a commitment, you know, sort of an I do. Um, so to the parents, parents, God has entrusted you with raising his child. Raising a child of God is a big undertaking. According to God's word, a series of statements here, this child in, is made in God's own image. That's from Genesis. This child has been well known by God long before you knew of its existence. Jeremiah chapter 1. Christ died for this child, according to John 3.16. Christ has commanded this child to love him and to live for his people, according to Matthew 22. This child has been commissioned to go into the world and baptize the nations, according to Matthew 28. I see you can make it, Marty. <laughs> you want me to read those again, that first couple? Okay, yeah. Um, this child is supposed to grow up and storm the gates of hell, according to Matthew 16. This child is to seek wisdom, though it costs him or her everything, according to Proverbs 4. Parents, to lead this child into such a task, you must instill discipline, Proverbs 23. Show them love, according to Matthew 7. Show Christ according to your relationships, especially marriage, Ephesians 5. Be quick to confess your own sins, 1 John 1. Not be harsh, according to Ephesians 6. Be prepared to answer questions, according to 1 Timothy 4. Obey Christ's commands, Romans 6 and Matthew 28. So here we go. Parents, do you accept this responsibility given to you by God? We do. we do. All right. Now it's your turn, family. 
Church, you are the bride of Christ and spiritual siblings of these parents. Any addition to their family is an addition to your family. The Bible says, 1 Timothy 5 through 8, and I will read those verses, but those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. It's much the same in our spiritual family, excuse me, family, Galatians 6.10. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. The Bible also says that we are aid in lifting up someone in hard time. Rest assured, these children will have hard times, and they will benefit from the faith of the family with the best interest in mind. From Galatians, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. Church, this is your turn. Do you accept the responsibility given to you by God? That was excellent. All right, very good. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, James and Kathy to come up here. James will say a prayer for the parents and children, and uh, Kathy will say a prayer for the church. And then uh, we'll let Jared take things back. If you would, join us in prayer right quick. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning. Uh, we want to thank you for these families, these parents, these kids that are dedicating uh, themselves to raise their kids in your ways. We just ask that you lead them, that you use us to help help them in times of need, that, that they stay on your path and, and raise godly kids and, and in themselves be godly parents, Lord. We just thank you for them again and ask that you be with them through their journey. Amen. What a lovely church family for these two precious, as well as the rest of our children. So uh, let's pray. God, thank you that um, we can in and of ourselves do nothing good, but you've promised to give us a helper, someone who would be with us, someone who would show us the way, someone who would be love in us when we have no love. And uh, God, I pray for us as a church family that we can love each other, that we can be supportive, encouraging um, of these parents, that we would not be judgmental or offer our own opinions or advice, but God, that we would uh, lift them up in prayer. And thank you for the opportunity to also be have influence, to pray for, to encourage, to build up, to strengthen um, these ones that are going to go out and be your salt and light in a desperate and dry land. And uh, God, we just ask and beg you for your spirit to show us how to be that in your name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks for setting up tables. <laughs> they say it takes a village. The Bible never said that. The Bible said it takes a church. You know, you know someone knows what they're doing by the way they walk up to the plate, don't you? Which is why you will soon find out I have no idea what I'm doing. I can tell, I can tell when my daughter's going to hit the ball before the first pitch is ever thrown by the way she walks up to the plate. And if you've ever coached t-ball... What do they not know how to do? <laughs> if the pitcher is there, you know, we walk up, we measure, we get, get all our stuff right. You guys have weird stuff that you do. You ever seen anybody that does this 18 times before they can ever swing? In kindergarten, they'll walk up, man, and they're just like, have no idea. They have no form. And so we get them. I want this toe here. I want this toe here. Now I want some of y'all to help me with, with my form. This is what I love about baseball because baseball, softball, mom and dad both played. So everybody's emotions are high. Things get wild in the softball field, do they not? 
If, you ever, if you've ever been in a fist fight in your city, it was probably at a softball field. So you want them. Now, I'll, I'll turn this. Y'all can't see the bottom, but I'm, I'm going to turn this so that you can help me with my form. When the kid stands up, we want to hit the ball about here. Am I in the right spot? No, because I want to hit the ball in front of me, right? I want to hit the ball in front of me. But you have to be taught that form, right? So I'm, I'm going I'm to turn it back, and I want some of y'all just to, just to help me for a minute. All right. What's wrong? My, t- my toes? You don't like my toes? Uh, he knows. I see he, we, little guys step too far, so I know if you step too far, you drop your bat. So I teach him to drop his heel, right? So he's like, your toes, because I tell him, get, that, get, your, get your heel up. I'm, I'm too far. What about my bat? What's wrong? I got I to gotta pull it back? Okay. Okay. It's funny how many of you knew that <laughs> awesome awesome okay now what's wrong uh, yeah. what do we what do we call this stance this stance is open or closed Close. this is closed where am I going to take the ball I'm going to foul right first base at best right yeah. some of y'all use this in slow pitch You're like right over first base because I'm jogging You can see when form is off. The more advanced you get, it gets a little harder. Fewer people can pick up on it. That's where I'm out. I can help you. 10, maybe 12 years old by the time, if you don't know more than me, you're in bad shape. I can help them with their stance, and so can you. That's what we've vowed to do as a church, work on form. Because in your life, when you start missing the ball, you know that somewhere, somewhere in your approach, things have gotten off. And so the pros can pick up on that. Man, when I get off, I don't know where it's going. Here's the big deal. What is the What's the number one thing you hear yelled at kids at the ballpark? Keep your, keep your eyes on the ball. You know what's funny about that? I've yet to meet a kid who said, you're right. <laughs> because we all say, my eye was on the ball. And they're right. Their eye was on the ball until they until they swing. They were watching the ball. They're telling the truth. They were watching the ball up until the point that they had to swing. I saw it all up until about 10 yards in front of me. But as soon as I swung, I jerked my head. And then we've got to hone in. And now we've got to make some adjustments. My form is off. So when I can go back and pick up on my form my son started off the year he was hitting the ball really well and then we had a good bit of the season where not so much my friend lane was watching him and he said you've got to start bunting and i thought well i want him to hit i don't want him to bunt but that's not what he meant he wanted him to be able to see the ball see the ball See the ball. And so all week long, we bunt, 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 bunt. And yesterday, he smacks a double into left field. Because someone picked up on his form. Beautiful swing. But we stopped watching the ball. Church, we get off on our form, don't we? And somewhere in that, When chaos strikes and you say, I don't know what to do, we can go back, probably not so far, and find out where we failed in our form. I want to take you to one of my very favorite books. I geek out on the book of Daniel. Love it. 
We're not going to probably jump into the prophetic side. We're going to do more than narrative. Uh, we're going to talk about this for a few weeks. But I want to take you into Daniel chapter 1. We're just going to walk through this for a minute. And we're going to check Daniel's form. Except for Daniel's a pro. So Daniel's going to check our form. Are you all ready for this? Is this mic on? Are you all ready for this? Okay, here we go. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel's in the Old Testament, okay? Uh, Daniel gave of prophecy that's already happened, some about the Messiah, some not about the Messiah. We, I fully believe that the wise men found Jesus. Did you ever think about that? Like, how did they know to look for a star and all this stuff? I fully believe uh, that they had studied the teachings of Daniel, and that's how they knew how to find Christ. It is a fascinating, fascinating book. Daniel was an extremely wise man. So this is Old Testament. The Bible's in Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament tells the story of God creating the world, choosing a people, promising that through those people a Messiah, a Savior would come. When he comes, that's the New Testament, okay? So I'm in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. Go with me. The, all the scripture's on the screen. Nobody expected you to walk in here a Bible scholar, okay? So we're working on form today. There's, there's no pros in the house today. Daniel Chapter 1, 1 through 2. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. That means Israel is under siege. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him along with some of the vessels from the house of God. That means the temple got ransacked. Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon to the house of his God and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. This, by the way, for those of you who are uh, big Indiana Jones fan, uh, fans, we don't know where the Ark of the Covenant went from this point. That was for interest's sake. That has nothing to do with the sermon. But God's people, somebody laid siege against them, ransacked God's holy temple, and took holy vessels that God commissioned to be made from God's holy temple. I thought God was powerful. How did someone ransack his temple? Interesting, isn't it? Does this happen? <laughs> that was an innocent voice that said no, right? Because you're like, oh, sweetheart, wait. Does this happen? Do God's people lose? I mean, did, did the apostles not die? Not from natural causes. Were they not executed, minus one who died in prison? Were there Christians who died in COVID? Was the temple really ransacked? Let me further that. Was that part of the plan? Or was it just allowed? Am I wasting my time to ask God to stop certain things from happening? James chapter 4 verse 3, uh, be on the scripture, uh, on, the, on the screen. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Anytime something bad comes up, we begin to ask God to take it away. And it is not always the will of God that painful times are taken away, unfortunately. But I thought being a Christian meant... Being a Christian means that we have a God who provides and walks through it with us. Not that it never comes. The Bible says hard times must come. The nation of Israel had to be taken. It was prophesied that they would be taken. Were people praying, God, don't let them take us? Yeah, I'm sure they were. God had already said, this is what I'm doing. This is part of my will. Let me ask you, when the end comes for us, you've read some prophecy, maybe you've heard some things. We'll pray for it not to happen. Will it still happen? 
So this is crazy. Do we just pray? No, 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 no. You pray and God will provide for you. But when you pray, you pray in God's will because sometimes some of the things that we don't want to happen are part of God's will. That's what's about to happen to Daniel. Daniel is going to forever change history. And I bet he didn't want any of it to happen. He had a hard life. I bet he didn't want any of it to happen. Now hold on, because you've had traumatic things and some dude in a green shirt is up here saying that that was supposed to happen to you. No, hold on. I don't know why some things have happened to you. But I do know that God has given us freedom. And some people have chosen their freedom to bring harm on you. And I am sorry for that. I cannot explain it. One day we will understand. But I do know that you have a God who will provide for you, who will be with you wherever you are. Daniel had a God that was with him as he watched his city be destroyed, as he watched family and friends be murdered, as he watched the temple, the most important thing to his entire people, to his entire religion, get ransacked. I'm sure he prayed for all of it to end. Let's keep going. Verse 3. The king ordered... Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the, from the nobility. Royal family and nobility. Verse 4. Young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. He was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to attend the king. Among them from the Judahites were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief eunuch gave them names. He gave them the names Belshazzar. That's Daniel's given name. Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Okay, if you've got to be taken, this is the way to do it, right? Because they're going to bring him in. They're going to educate him. This is the way to do it. I'm sorry, guys. I have got to. Uh, I will be up here for two straight hours. I have no clock in the back today. If you've got to be there, this is the way to do it. Daniel, you've been selected. They're going to feed you well. This is not like slavery that the rest of your people are going to have to be a part of. This is like you are going to university. You're going to be fed from the king's resources. Don't mess it up. This is what I want to say. Daniel had a chance to fit in. All he had to do was soak up the culture that they were giving him, right? There's more than one way to skin a cat. Just listen to what they tell you, Daniel, and do that. And you're going to be okay. You've been selected. You've been pulled out. You're one of the cool kids, Daniel. Do you know that sometimes the in crowd is the hardest place from which to stand up? For what you believe? Because if you're an outcast, you're already cast it out. <laughs> There's no problem bucking the system. You're not part of the system anyways. It's the culture that you're already in, that you're already in, inundated in, people that you already fit in with. That's when it's hard to stand up. Daniel's been selected. He can be one of the cool kids. But maybe he was selected for something different. Right? Maybe he was selected for something different. You know, as you watch a softball team, a baseball team get up to bat, 
I can tell you what kind of hitter they are by what place they've been placed in the batting lineup. You've got somebody that can just smash the ball, not real quick, but can hit the ball. Hit bombs! Where do you put them in the batting lineup? <laughs> Everybody said the same thing. Four. Why? Clean up, baby. I want bases loaded when this boy, when this girl gets up there. There's a reason you've been put in the place you've been put. You got somebody who just consistently can get on base just about every time. Not a real smash hitter, but can get on base. Where do you put them? Number one, somebody's pretty consistent and can steal any base anytime. Where do you put them? Also number one. Those two are going to have to compete, right? Get the wheels in there so number four can get up and bat. There's a reason you were put in the year you were born. Some of y'all's years were 19 and none of your business. I get it. There's a reason you were born when you were born, where you were born. God is the ultimate coach, and he knew exactly where to put you in the batting lineup. I don't know if anyone else could have done what Daniel has done. There was a reason he was put where he was, and he could have said, nobody can hit off of this pitcher. It's okay. He could have said, I'm going to have to fit in. They're going to kill me. What good could I be to God if they kill me? He has a chance to stand up for what he believes. He has a chance to play his position you weren't put where you are for no reason. You weren't put where you are to go with the flow. To do what everyone else is doing. God put you in this batting lineup for a reason. You're in the right house. You're in the right body, believe it or not. You're in the right time, place, and space. Sometimes... It's harder to break up in a bad relationship than to never go out in the first place. Was that deep or was that, did that just? Let's get to that. Verse 8, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. Now, what does that mean? When I was little, I was taught this in Sunday school, and they were like, they were offering Daniel like chips and hot dogs and he just was not going to eat the junk. That's not at all what it means. Daniel was Jewish, and he was not supposed to defile himself with food that was not kosher. It was part of his religion, and it stayed that way until Jesus came and fulfilled the old law and gave us a new law. You can read that all through Hebrew. You can read that in 1 Peter. Uh, you, you read it in pretty much any, anywhere in the New Testament. And Jesus fulfilled the old, old law. Until then, this is how they were commanded to live. And Daniel had a chance to be one of the cool kids. He had a chance to fit in. And he said, I will not defile myself with that food. Okay? So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. Excuse me, eunuch. <laughs> I don't want to trouble you or anything. But I'm not going to eat any of this. I want you to give me a completely different menu in my slavery. Thank you. And please. Verse 9, God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. Yet he said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king who assigned your food and drink. What if he sees your faces looking thinner than the other young men your age? You would endanger my life with the king. So Daniel said to the guard whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. He agreed with them about this and tested them for 10 days. Verse 15, at the end of 10 days, they looked better and healthier than the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables 
Now, curiosity's sake, there's a whole Daniel diet where you're only supposed to eat vegetables, right? And I'm not saying that your the vegetables aren't great for you. That's not the reason. The reason was because they couldn't pre- prepare meat kosher. And so they were eating vegetables because that's the only kosher item that they could get from the cafeteria. Does that, does that make sense? It wasn't just because you're only supposed to eat vegetables. I had to put that in there or Dusty will not let me live it down <laughs> all week. When God calls you to something, he makes a way. Can you imagine what it took for Daniel to request this? This was a big ask. Hey, listen, I know you guys are supposed to take orders from the king, and if you don't, he'll murder you, but could we make a substitution? And then the guy comes out with, listen, if I do this for you, And the king comes in and sees you who are supposed to attend him, who are supposed to serve him, and you look bad and he finds out that I've done this, I get killed. You know, I'm going to just be real honest here and say, even if I would have had the bravery to ask for a kosher meal, at this point I would have been like, you know what, you're right. That's all the excuse I need. Did you do that when you were little? It's like your dad said, hey, I'm going to be at work. I'll be home late, somebody needs to mow, you're up. And you go outside, and it didn't start, and you're like, well, I can't. <laughs> you, you, might, you get onto that, and you just start pulling it halfway. Wouldn't start, Dad. We're looking for an excuse. And instead of saying, God, here's the reasons, because there's reasons. Like there's some stuff that God has prompted you to do. I want you to live a different way. I want you to do marriage a different way. I want you to do relationships a different way. I want you to do finances a different, di- different way. And, and, and then somebody comes up and is like, hey, the king will kill me if I give you different food and you don't look good. And we lack confidence in what God has called us to do. And so we're like, you know what? I don't want to trouble anybody. I'll just, I'll just do what everybody else is doing. That's all we need. It's just a snippet of an excuse for why we don't really have to follow God, not knowing that God is going to make provisions for you. And if I say, have you seen God move? Have you seen miraculous things? Most Christians have to say No. Actually, most will say yes, and then they'll give me something that, uh, quite frankly, is completely superstition. So most of us will say, no, I've not seen God make a miraculous provision. And the reason is because we've never followed him to the point that we needed miraculous provision. But Daniel does, and God provides. He gives him favor with this guy. And instead of saying, you know what, here's an excuse, Daniel does what we need to apply in so many areas of our life. You know what? Let's try this for 10 days. There were some things, you know, there's a few things that we do different. We still have worship, and we still have... uh, This, this looks just like a church service that you've always been to. We do a few things a little different, and it's because I was taught to do that different, right? And some of you, have, let, let's bring up something controversial. My right elbow. Where should it be? Here or here? Now, if you're in softball, you say here. Baseball players say When I started, started to plant this church, I was seeking wisdom. I was seeking coaches. Help me with my form. And they changed my form. And I said, this is not the way I've been doing it. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was a pastor, a very successful pastor, said, tell you what, Do what I tell you for a year. If it doesn't work out, do it your way. You 
change my form. I don't know how this is going to work. Try it for a year. If it doesn't work out, do it your way. And I will tell you that there are things that the world is doing that we have just grafted in as acceptable in our own lives. And God is going, Jared, try it before you tell me it doesn't work. Before you say that I can't make the provisions. Before you say that you can't obey me. Try God's way. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. If God is prompting your heart to do something different, dude, taste it. What if we decided to see what we look like in 10 days? You know what would change your life? I have to do this myself all the time. Eight o'clock, no more screens. You would go to sleep earlier, which means you would be happier in the morning, which means that you would be with the Lord in the morning. Some of y'all wake up like, trust me. <laughs> It ain't good for me to be nobody, especially Jesus. Because you're tired. Because you were watching TV all night. I don't watch TV. You were watching little TV. First Timothy 4.12. Paul is writing to Timothy. And he says, don't let anyone despise your youth, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. I love that. Don't let anyone despise your youth, but set an example. He was telling Timothy, God has called you to something. God has put you in the lineup for a reason. And you're the youngest guy on, a, on the team. But don't let anybody laugh at you because you're young. You know what will shut them up? Hit the ball. Set an example. They'll start batting like you. It didn't have to be young. He could have said, don't let anyone despise you because of your age. Be the old guy that sets an example. Don't let anyone despise you because of your size. Don't let anyone despise you because of your background. I want you to get up to the ball and I really don't care what you've been through before. I want you to use the form that I taught you. I want you to keep your eye on the ball and I want you to make everyone else want to bat like you. Don't let anybody, church, don't let anybody despise your background. Don't let anybody despise your pedigree, your socioeconomic status, where you're from. Nobody cares. Hit the ball. Use the form that God has given you and set an example. And they look at your life and they're like, wow. He says, set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. They want to be just like you. Spiritually, like, I want to hit just like you. You're like, you don't know my past. But God showed me form. There are certain things that just translate. I don't care your body type, and we can make little tweaks. We can make adjustments. But despite, I don't care, boy, girl, athletic, coordinated. I don't care. There's just some things that you need to do to hit the ball well. And God brings us those things, and we make excuses for why we can't do them. But God said, you're up to bat. Use the form that I taught you. Do what I said for 10 days, and let's see how you look. And in 10 days, they looked healthier than everyone else. He could have said, I'm just a slave. It could have been how he defined himself. Remember, he was selected from royalty. He was part of the nobles. They looked for young men without a physical defect and without all those things. And, and he, he was it. But now he's subject. So he was a noble and then he was a slave. Which was he? He was a follower of God. He didn't get defined by his circumstances. He got defined by his faith. 
He got defined by what he believed in. He acted according to what he believed in. He didn't have to be in the royal palace, so to speak, to act like a believer. He does his best work in bondage. You say, well, I'm just a, don't be just a anything. Well, you don't understand what happened. I, I, I haven't. The only life I've ever lived is mine. I've never lived yours. But my God says you're not defined by that. My God says that he's put you up to bat. And your circumstances don't define the form that you get to use. Real quick. Verse 17 and 20. God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. At the end of the time, sorry, verse 18. At the end of the time that the king had said to, the, uh, to present them, the chief eunuch presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king interviewed them, and among all of them, no one was found equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they began to attend the king in every matter of wisdom and understanding. The king consulted them about. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and mediums in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. If you know your history, he served lots of kings. He served different empires. And he was found wiser than all of them in every empire, under every king, every regime, and everybody who took over found Daniel more wise and everyone wants to be like Daniel but nobody wants to eat vegetables <laughs> metaphorically you know what I'm saying we all want to be the one who hits the home run to win the game but nobody wants to bunt eight practices in a row nobody wants to work on keeping your eye on the ball we want to be the guy that wins. And God says, form. I want you to use your form. And when you're hitting and you know your form is right, you can walk up confidently. I told you before, I know, I know when my daughter's going to hit the ball, I know by the way she walks up. Christian, you haven't worked on your form in a while and you're walking up to the plate. Hosanna, Hosanna, strike out. Because you're not confident. So we haven't practiced. We haven't done the right thing. God says, try it for 10 days and see if you don't start hitting the ball. God says, follow my word, even when it's something that I don't want you to do. So we're doing all kinds of kids stuff today. We're talking all about, uh, we, we, we did uh, parents today dedicating children form that's what the church said we will do form it takes a church i want you to be able to talk to my kids and say hey i love you you're better than this please don't say i expect better from a preacher's kid they're your family your kids are my family we're not rubbing those in it we're saying hey remember how i taught you to keep your eye on the ball you're slinging your head <laughs> hey, you're not getting your hips forward. You're not driving the ball. Hey, I see that you're not doing the right thing. You're probably not spending any time in your word. I see that, I, I see that you're following the crowd, and, and when they're doing things, you're not spending time with the Lord. You're not praying about this, are you? Form, fundamentals. Try it for 10 days and see if you're not more healthy than everyone who's around you. I want you all to pray with me. Worship team, go ahead and come up. God, I pray that we will use our, our fundamentals that you teach us, God. I pray that we will read your word, that we will pray to you, that we will, uh, that we will continue to go to church and that we will be the church that you want us to be, God. Lord, I know that there are hurting hearts in this place who say, I just need a word from the Lord. God, you know I've been one of them probably more than not. And God, I pray that we will position ourselves in a place to hear from you. 
that we will use that form, God, that we will eat those vegetables, that we will take that kosher meal, that we will, we will reject the king's food, even though it looks enticing, God, that we will take what you have set before us, God. I pray for courage for your people, God. I pray, Lord, that we will not look like the world. Though we are not better than anyone, God, I pray that we won't look like them because we're just like hitting the ball, so to speak, God. I pray that your people will be blessed. God, I pray that your people will thrive in hard times and everyone will say, I want to follow this example, God. I pray that we will do that for our own children. I pray that we will do that for the friends of our children, that our entire community will look at us and say, this must be the way that we should live because look at how their God is blessing them. God, we serve a God in a world that is not serving God. We, we serve you, God, when the world says maybe that we're crazy for doing it, Father, and we need you like every day we need you to continue to give us provision so we ask these things in the name of jesus amen please stand and worship with us